inaugurated in 2004 by the International Forum for Democratic Studies at the National Endowment for Democracy and the Monk School for Global Affairs at the University of Toronto, the Seymour Martin Lipset Lecture on Democracy in the World has established itself as one of the most important forums for discourse on democracy. Organized with joint US-Canadian sponsorship, the lecture is named for one of the great democratic scholars and public intellectuals of the 20th century. Seymour Martin Lipset's scholarship on such themes as the conditions for democracy, political parties, voting behavior, ideologies, and public opinion constitutes one of the most prolific, insightful, and widely read bodies of work on democracy ever produced by a single author. Over the years, the Lipset Lecture has attracted some of the world's foremost scholars to address the critical questions relating to democracy, its progress, and the challenges emerging to it. From topics as diverse as the relationship between religion and democracy, to the implications of the Arab revolutions, to the state of democracy in Russia, as well as the essential questions of combating corruption and nurturing good governance, the Lipset Lecture consistently has been at the leading edge of the debate. This year, we continue the tradition of illustrious speakers addressing the issues that are central to the condition of democracy. And it's therefore my great pleasure and honor to introduce this year's lecturer, Dr. Minchin Pei. Minchin Pei is the Tom and Margot Pritzker 72 Professor of Government and George R. Roberts Fellow at Claremont McKenna College. He serves on the editorial board of the Journal of Democracy and is editor-in-chief of the China Leadership Monitor. Prior to joining Claremont McKenna in 2009, Dr. Pei was a senior associate and the director of the China program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Dr. Pei received his PhD in political science from the Harvard University. He is a recipient of numerous prestigious fellowships, including the National Fellowship at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, the McNamara Fellowship at the World Bank, and the Olin Faculty Fellowship of the Olin Foundation. And so, without further ado, I give you Dr. Minchin Pei to deliver the 2020 Seymour Martin Lipset Lecture on Democracy in the World. I'm greatly honored and deeply humbled by the invitation of the National Endowment for Democracy and the Canadian Embassy to deliver this year's Seymour Martin Lipset Lecture. Professor, lecture, uh, Professor Lipset's insight that economic modernization creates favorable conditions for stable democracy is one of the most influential, robust, and time-tested theories in social science. More than six decades after the publication of so, some social requisites of democracy, Professor Lipset's work continues to frame scholarly debates and inspire new research. In my case, like last year's speaker, Political Man was also one of the first books in political science I read as a graduate student. I did not study under Professor Lipset, but I had the good fortune of attending one of his seminars in the late 80s on why the US did not have socialism. But the modernization theory he has founded or has formulated has influenced my own research for the last three decades. Today, as China has economically prospered but retained its one party regime, many are questioning whether the positive relationship between modernization and democracy remains valid. I believe that Professor Lipset's modernization theory can still help illuminate the puzzle why the relationship between economic development and democracy is not as straightforward in communist regimes as in more conventional dictatorships. In his classic article in 1959, Professor Lipset cautions that unique events may account for either the persistence or the failure of democracy in any particular society. He refers briefly to the communist regimes in Eastern Europe and warns that the presence of communists precludes 
an easy prediction that economic development will stabilize democracy in these European countries. In his presidential address to the American Sociological Association in 1993, revisiting his thesis, Professor Lipset makes the connection between regime types and democratization. He argues, the more resources of power, status, and wealth are concentrated in the state, the harder it is to institutionalize democracy. Although he did not explicitly identify regimes with a high concentration of power, status, and wealth as totalitarian, such concentration is a defining feature of totalitarian and post-totalitarian regimes. When we look at the experience of transition to democracy in the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, we should find that their difficult journey from communism bears out Professor Lipset's observation of the negative relationship between the concentration of power in the state and democracy. The argument I wish to make in this lecture is that democratizing communist dictatorships poses unique challenges. The legacies of totalitarianism cast a long, dark shadow and constrain possible paths to democracy. In retrospect, the most promising path to democracy in countries ruled on the communist dictatorships is the quick replacement of such regimes in a revolutionary process. Although the costs of transition are high and the long-term prospects for democratic consolidation are by no means guaranteed, the destruction of totalitarian institutions in this process accomplishes the first vital step that raises the odds of successful democratization for the long term. By contrast, communist dictatorships that embark on economic reform first without democratizing changes may initially achieve rapid social economic progress. But the legacy institutions of totalitarianism enable such dictatorships to blunt and neutralize the democratizing effects of economic development for an extended period of time. Transition away from communism along this path is also likely to get stuck because privileged apparatchiks of the Leninist party state can block economic reform and prevent democratization in order to keep their power and privileges. Even worse than stagnant transition is reversion to neo-Stalinist rule. As China's experience on the Xi Jinping shows, the lack of democratic reform and rule of law facilitates the rise of a strongman who can impose his will both on the party and Chinese society through rule of fear. To understand why rapid economic modernization has not democratized China, we must focus on how the legacies of totalitarianism constrain the democratizing potential of rapid modernization. Here I offer three propositions. First, legacies of totalitarianism blunt and neutralize the democratizing effects of economic modernization. At the outset of China's transition from Maoist totalitarian rule in 1979, the leadership of the Communist Party under Deng Xiaoping made a strategic choice of saving one-party rule with economic reform and modernization. As Deng himself unambiguously affirmed, on several occasions, the goal of his reform was to maintain, not change, or in any way endanger the political monopoly of the Communist Party. As a result, the Chinese Communist Party has deliberately and largely successfully, I would say, preserved the core institutions of totalitarianism in the post-Mao period. In particular, the Leninist Party state, a far-reaching and capable repressive, repressive apparatus, they control of the media and the commanding heights of the economy. Compared with communist regimes 
in the post-Stalinist Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, China's post-Mao period stands out for its immense progress in economic reform, growth of the private sector, and integration with the global economy. Yet, in the long run, the preservation of these legacy institutions of totalitarian rule has both blunted and even neutralized the liberalizing and democratizing effects of economic change. As my colleague Professor Nason shows in his Lipset lecture in 2015, rapid economic growth may have created a sizable new middle class in China. But China's middle class differs from its counterparts in other societies in one important respect. It is less autonomous and more dependent on the state because a significant share of China's professionals, managers, and skilled workers are employed in the state sector. Thanks to the party's control over the state and its immense resources, such as education and employment opportunities, the Chinese Communist Party in the post tiananmen era was able to carry out a campaign of co-opting social elites, like college students, professionals, and private entrepreneurs to broaden its base of support. Social control by the Communist Party has also stunted the growth of autonomous social organizations that might promote democratization from below. Independent religious groups, autonomous labor unions, student organizations, and professional associations are banned in China today. In, 19, in 2018, the party even arrested members of an independent Marxist student group. The majority of the so-called civil society groups are, to use an Orwellian doublespeak, government-organized non-government organizations, or gongo. Few can operate independently outside the purview of the state. Even more worryingly, as rapid economic growth generates ever-rising revenue, the Chinese Communist Party can modernize and strengthen its repressive capacity, expand surveillance, and limit the threat of information revolution. Adjusted for inflation, real spending on domestic security rose about eight times from 2002 and 2018. Today, the Chinese party state is investing even more resources in an Orwellian surveillance state equipped with the most advanced technologies, such as artificial intelligence, facial recognition, and big data. The second explanation for the China puzzle is that without removing entrenched interest groups in the Leninist party state, not only economic reform will lose momentum, but also the regime tends to grow even more resistant to democratic, to democratization and hostile to democratic values. As I argue in my book published in 2006, China's Trapped Transition, transition from communism led by economic reform tends to get stuck because entrenched interests can use the power of the party state to defend their privileges. Economically, these entrenched groups can frustrate further reforms that threaten their control of the commanding heights of the economy. In the political realm, the same entrenched interest groups become even more resistant to democracy because they fully understand that democratizing reforms will not only threaten their political power, but also threaten their economic privileges. Indeed, the, revolu the evolution of the post tiananmen regime in China bears out this observation. Initially promising economic reform in the 1990s gradually petered out. In the 2000s, politically, the party's resistance to meaningful political reform also began to harden once seen as a promising reform of grassroots democracy, village elections gradually degenerated into uncompetitive political rituals. Modest legal reforms 
died a quiet death as the party reasserted its control over the legal system and reversed once promising experiments initiated under less conservative leadership. In the same period, the party also launched an escalating propaganda campaign against universal values of liberalism. The third and final explanation for the China puzzle is that the lack of political reform greatly raises the risks of reversion to strongman rule. Ironically, the CCP may have become a victim of its own success in blocking political reform. As political developments in China since the rise of Xi Jinping demonstrate, the failure of the party to implement such reforms has now boomeranged. Xi Jinping has concentrated power in his hands and reintroduced the rule of fear, resurrecting a system done and his fellow victims of the Cultural Revolution tried to prevent. Until Xi's rise, many of the reforms put in place by Deng Xiaoping and his fellow survivors of Maoism were thought to have addressed successfully well-known laws of totalitarianism, such as the concentration of power in the hands of a dominant leader, power struggle over succession, and lack of security for the ruling elites. In the 1980s, Deng and his colleagues undertook a serious effort to establish rules of collective leadership, term limits, and elite security. But Deng's attempt to prevent the return of a Mao-like figure suffered from several fatal weaknesses. To keep maximum discretion for the top leadership, including himself, then made nearly all the key provisions regarding age and term limits of top leadership and regime uh, elite security vague and unenforceable. For instance, there was no formal limit on the age and term of Politburo members. The CCP general secretary or the chairman of the Central Military Commission the only term limited position was the, was the presidency of the People's Republic, a largely ceremonial position. Whatever rules the party established were easy to change. Xi's effortless removal of the constitutional limit on the presidency in 2018 is just one example. In retrospect, the only way to enforce rules of collective leadership, maintain age and term limit, and provide for the security of the top elites is to implement broader political reforms, such as the establishment of an independent judiciary and democratization. These changes could function as credible third party enforcers and autonomous centers of power. But in post Mao China, such reforms were seen as anathema because they could undermine one-party rule and limit the discretion of its top leaders. In the analysis, if the analysis offered, offered above provides an explanation why economic modernization in post-Mao China has not yet democratized the country, the natural follow-up question is, what will? Paradoxically, the regression to new Stalinist rule on the Xi Jinping may accelerate rather than prevent China's democratization in the future because new Stalinism is so self-destructive that it will likely weaken rather than strengthen one-party rule. To understand this paradox, we must first examine Xi Jinping's strategic thinking and the factors that will likely seal the fate of China's neo-Stalinist revival. As our preceding analysis illustrates, the legacy institutions of totalitarianism have been decaying too slowly to allow the effects of economic modernization to democratize China. But for Xi Jinping, who is ideologically committed to communism, such decay is not only too fast, 
but unacceptable as a threat to the continuation of one party rule. As revealed by his speeches, the fall of the Soviet Union weighs heavily on China's leader. Shortly after he was appointed the party chief, Xi Jinping warned the party officials to heed the lessons of the Soviet collapse. In an unpublished speech in December 2012, barely a month after he became the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, Xi Jinping put the party's survival in stark terms. Why did the Soviet Union disintegrate? Why did the Soviet Communist Party collapse? He asked rhetorically before providing his own answer. He says, an important reason was that their ideals and convictions wavered. Finally, all it took was one quiet word from Gorbachev to declare the dissolution, the dissolution of the Soviet Communist Party, and the Great Party was gone. In the end, nobody was a real man. Nobody came out to resist. His Xi Jinping's prescription for reversing the decay of post-totalitarianism in China is the reintroduction of some of the core elements of Stalinist rule. After eight years in power, he has engineered a new Stalinist political revolution that has fundamentally altered the trajectory of post mao China. Besides removing collective leadership and making himself the dominant leader, Xi Jinping has imposed strict disciplines on a party corrupted by materialism, renewed ideological indoctrination, reinstated purge, escalated repression against civil society and ethnic minorities, promoted state capitalism, and pursued a confrontational foreign policy against the West. Although she himself is convinced that this survival strategy will reinvigorate a decaying regime, it is far from clear that he has actually learned the right lessons from the Soviet collapse. If anything, this survival strategy will almost certainly exacerbate existing, existing tensions, create new risks, and undermine the CCP's prospects of long-term survival for the following reasons. First, the over-concentration of power leads to pervasive bureaucratic passivity, lack of diversity of viewpoints in policymaking, excessive risk-taking, and inability to self-correct mistakes. Some of Xi's signature policies in the last eight years have already reconfirmed the pitfalls of strongman rule. China's ambitious Belt and Road Initiative, the building of militarized artificial islands in the disputed waters of the South China Sea, the mass incarceration of Muslims in Xinjiang, and the imposition of a national security law in Hong Kong have produced adverse outcomes that are likely to cost the party dearly. Xi's efforts to strengthen the party through ideological indoctrination are unlikely to make its 92 million members genuine believers in that ideology completely irrelevant to their lived experience. In practice, such top-down campaigns of indoctrination inevitably degenerate into meaningless political rituals party members perform in order to feign loyalty and compliance. Second, a succession struggle now looms over the horizon. After abolishing the presidential term limit in early 2018, Xi Jinping is now set for open-ended rule. Fear of a strong potential rival a heartbeat away will motivate him to install a weak loyalist as successor, as suggested by the experience following the deaths of Stalin and Mao a power struggle will most likely break out. Break out. If Xi's anointed successor loses the fight, his own legacy 
could be at risk. Like Nikita Khrushchev and Deng Xiaoping, the winner of the post-Xi power struggle will be incentivized to chart a new course and won't be shy to abandon his legacies. Third, the dissipation of China's economic momentum will un undercut the regime's performance legitimacy in the coming years. Of all the factors responsible for the survival of post-totalitarianism in China, the most important is its rapid economic growth. The biggest question now is whether Xi's economic policies will sustain growth at a reasonable rate. The most economic plan, the most recent economic plan approved by the party central committee just now, just a few months, just a month ago, envisions an annual growth rate of around 4.7% between now and 2035. If this happens, it will double China's economic growth, uh, double the size of the Chinese economy. But such a rosy forecast may not pan out because of China's deteriorating demographics. In addition, the party's latest economic blueprint contains no radical reforms that will improve efficiency. Without genuine reforms, China will encounter great difficulties in sustaining growth in the coming decade. Fourth, strategic competition with the U.S. will exacerbate, will exact a crippling toll on China. China's greatly backward at home and aggressive foreign policies have put the country on a collision course with the United States and its democratic allies. Even though this new strategic conflict is still unfolding, it could imperil the party's hold on power. Driven by the logic of containment, comprehensive economic decoupling between China and the US now appears inevitable. If the US succeeds, in rallying its allies to its cause, the impact on China would be devastating. On the security front, escalating tensions will precipitate an arms race and divert resources from China's competing domestic needs. Geopolitically, the imperative of strategic competition with the US also requires China to invest resources to show up friendly and mostly autocratic regimes. Grandiose but dubious projects that, such as the Belt and Road Initiative conceived to project China's power will be draining hundreds of billions of dollars from China's coffers. Even though it is too early to predict how the US-China strategic competition will eventually end, it is tempting to draw parallels with the last Cold War. Indeed, given the strategic odds stacked against the party, it may not be a stretch to foresee the replication of many of the economic, political, and security conditions in the late Soviet period that plunged the regime into an existential crisis. Under such a scenario, we will have an opportunity to reconfirm Professor Lipset's modernization theory. By the end of the Xi Jinping period, let us say around 2035, just for the sake of argument, China's socioeconomic conditions will almost certainly be even more favorable for democratic breakthrough than it is, than they are today. Even if we assume that China's e economy will grow at a modest 3% per year, per capita income in China in 2035 will exceed $25,000 in purchasing power parity terms. In terms of education attainment, China will add over 100 million college graduates in the same period, raising the share of population with a college degree to more than 20%. To be sure, it is impossible to know whether Chinese society will be politically mobilized to replace one-party rule 
with democracy in 2035. But with a per capita income equal to that of Chile today, and about 300 million citizens with a college education, Chinese society will definitely have far greater capacity than today to, democ to seek democratic change if it wants to. If the fate of communist dictatorships in the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe offers any guidance for thinking about China's future, a bet worth making today is that its long journey from Maoist totalitarianism to neo-Stalinism with a post-totalitarian detour will merely delay but not prevent a rendezvous with its democratic future. When that happens, Professor Lipset's modernization thesis shall have its last laugh, and China will find, may finally march out of the long dark shadow of its totalitarian past. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.